people are still joining us because I know Sam's got lots to share. So um, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Brett Thielen. I'm the science director with the Harris Center for Conservation Education. We are the organization sponsoring tonight's Zoom. Um, for those of you who might be new to us, which I think might, might be quite a few of you if we've got people from so far afield, we are a nonprofit organization based in the Monadnock region of Southwest New Hampshire, and we help people fall in love with the natural world through land protection, conservation research, and education of all ages. So if you are local to us, um, you might be interested to know that we've protected more than 24,000 acres of land from development. Much of that is open to hiking and birding and caterpillar watching and other recreation. Um, we also coordinate conservation research on our protected lands and throughout the region through a variety of community science projects. And really at the heart of everything we do is education for all ages from babies and backpacks to residents of retirement communities and all points in between. So if you're local and you have a young person in your life, there's a really good chance that they've spent some time with a Harris Center naturalist during their school day. We work with 30 local schools, getting kids outside um, and seeing nature in their schoolyards and backyards. And then for the public, we have an incredible calendar of events more than 100, probably close to 150 every year, most of which are free of charge. And we're starting to get back into some in-person events again locally, like um, guided outings, hikes, and birding trips. But um, there's been quite a silver lining of the pandemic for us with these Zoom programs and that we're able to welcome speakers sometimes from far afield and also audience members from far afield. So tonight um, is a really, Wonderful talk, I'm really excited for it. And Other than that, enjoy the moths, butterflies, and caterpillars. All right, so um, now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Sam Jaffe. Um, he is a truly gifted naturalist, educator, photographer. Um, I never thought I, I never thought caterpillars were beautiful until I met Sam and saw his photos, and then I, I learned the error of my ways. So he's also the founder and executive director of the Caterpillar Lab, which is another nonprofit organization based here in the Monadnock region, although they do caterpillar education throughout the Northeast and I think sometimes even beyond. So um, without any further ado, take it away, Sam. Hi, thanks, Brett. Um, well, I'm glad to be here and, and with the Harris Center's audience. Um, I was gonna say how nice it is to be sort of uh, making contact with our local community, but I was also excited to see that people are joining from all over the place, really all over the country. Um, but it is true. I mean, I've, I've been giving some of these talks to groups all over the country, but I haven't been able to see our, our neighbors mm -hmm. down the street. Um, we haven't had our open hours or been at the local farmer's market recently. I think that's all just around the bend. So anybody watching tonight who, um, you know, lives in Southern New Hampshire, look for us out there and you can watch on our website to see if we're going to be opening our doors because um, I'd love to see you all in person. Um, but it's also sort of a pleasure to bring the lab itself into your living rooms like this. We have a lot of resources here um, and a lot of cool creatures that I can share um, this way that I couldn't otherwise. Um, so I guess by way of further introduction, let me just explain the space I'm in. I am in the Caterpillar Lab. I'm in the museum space. So stretching out for me here, we've got caterpillar photographs, art, giant stuffed caterpillars, um, big fan of those, giant moths, rearing cages full of Oh, there's noctuids over there. And we've got viceroy and red spotted purple butterfly caterpillars. Um, open air displays of tent caterpillars. So if you've seen those webs in the trees, we have them just free form out here. We have to feed them every day. If we forget to put the cherry next to the tents, they just end up on the ceiling, um, which is sort of fun. We, we have a few school systems set up rearing actual tent caterpillar masses. And invariably they forget to feed them enough over the weekend, one or two weekends in the process. And they come in to find tent caterpillar masses on the blackboard or out in the hallway. Um, a little bit of natural chaos is good for a school system, I think. Um, in the back, I've got our main rearing area where we actually raise upwards of 600 species of caterpillar a year, um, more now that we're actually working on a, on a book, a guide, um, hoping to cover 800 to 1,000 species. 
I know I'm, it's daunting. <laughs> um, and uh, in the back is where we do our photography, film, and uh, set up all of these programs. Um, right here, I've got a screen behind me set up with a digital microscope that I'll be using. And before we really get going, I thought I would just share um, a cool find from this morning and also something that happened at the lab this morning. Um, we'll see if anybody gets into this the way I do. Uh, this is a caterpillar I found at the airport today. Uh, it may not be much to look at, uh, but it's new to me and, and that's exciting. Uh, I turned over a log on a trail at the airport and the log had some bracket fungus on it. Underneath the log was what we can call a undifferentiated fungal mat, just basically a bunch of, of pale slime. And on it was this great glossy black idia caterpillar. Um, its head is actually down here curved around and it's eating the bracket fungus. So this is a specialist on mushrooms. It eats uh, bracket fungus, undifferentiated fungal mats, my new favorite term. Um, and I've you know, been looking for these for years. They overwinter as tiny little caterpillars and you've got a brief window when you can find them. It's a cool life history. Um, and I, I actually sort of like that it's got fungus growing on its back as well as the fact that it's eating it. So this little uh, creepy caterpillar might not be for everyone. So I've also got some, some rather more glorious species, but we're just looking at it in this little box here. So that's a new one for me. <laughs> but this morning we had the arrival of some of North America's most spectacular insects at the lab here. So this is the giant Cecropia silk moth, um, Hylophora Cecropia. Let me try and get you a really good view. This is the largest flying insect in North America. It can have up to a six inch wingspan um, and it lives right here in New England. And I'm really happy to be able to show this moth in particular because for me, this was a really eye-opening creature. When I was a kid and I saw my first Cecropia moth, I had no idea that things like this lived here. You know, you could have shown me or, or most people in my lives a picture of something like this and they would have thought, well, that's a tropical insect. That's Australian or African, but we have amazing creatures right here. And that's a big part of what we're focused on at the lab is to show the diversity and the beauty and the charisma and sometimes the size <laughs> um, and the oddity of, of a lot of our local creatures. Um, and to surprise people like I was surprised by this moth as a kid, hoping that we'll, we'll hook them, that people will be suddenly aware that there's more to discover than they, they thought there was before, uh, even in spaces like their backyards. Um, so this creature here, we actually had it close in the lab uh, so we could get eggs from it um, and have caterpillars at our program uh, earlier in the spring. And those caterpillars are these big green breakfast sausage caterpillars with uh, different color bobbles all over their backs. And I've actually got a picture of those. Um, so this is what we do at the Caterpillar Lab. We take these colorful, surprising, charismatic insects around and we get them to meet the public. Um, and this little girl was just totally enamored by the giant Cecropia caterpillar here. Her mother was not. Uh, her mother was not a big fan, I think. Um, but uh, we were all a big fan of this little girl and how much she liked the caterpillar. So this was just one of those moments that really meant a lot to us. Um, and we see this repeated again and again at our programs and in the lab. Um, this is at the Boston Children's Museum. She spent about half an hour singing to all of the caterpillars on display and was particularly excited about the hickory horned devil, this caterpillar, which is about the size of a hot dog, the largest one that we rear and the longest caterpillar in North America. At a Keene farmer's market, um, we had this young family uh, looking for leaf edge mimics on the birch. They were really intense. They went to every display we had to seek out all of these camouflaged and mimicking caterpillars. Um, thought it was really funny that they kept getting tricked. So caterpillars, again, bringing sort of different experiences and drawing people in. Um, to do the work that we do, we depend on our resource, you know, we depend on the caterpillars, this strange cast of, of quirky characters to attract people to the tables uh, so that we can tell their stories and engage. Uh, caterpillars really lend themselves as ambassador animals. They're incredibly diverse. Um, we have around three to 4,000 species of butterfly and moth and thus caterpillars in New England alone. 
And many of those have large caterpillars with very different colors and pattern shapes, defensive adaptations. I'm seeing ones with huge horns, inflatable tails, leaf mimicry. We've got false eye spots. Um, what else we got here? One that decorates itself with petals, a very poisonous species you wouldn't want to eat and stinging species you wouldn't want to touch. Um, ones that are so hairy you can't even find the caterpillar underneath. And, and it just goes on and on and on. So this diversity really helps us in our programming, helps us continue to surprise and explore. But it's really not just a diversity of shape, size, and color. Each and every one of the caterpillars that just sort of swept by there and, and all the rest, they all have their own specific whole stories. Each one of these caterpillars is just the larval stage of a larger life cycle. It's a caterpillar that has a relationship with a host plant. It's a caterpillar that has very strange relationships with host uh, uh, parasites and uh, predators. The whole story of each one of these is much larger than the image in front of you. And we've become very excited to tell those whole stories. So when we have an exhibit with these caterpillars there, yes, we, we get to be excited about the twig mimic, but we also look at the twig mimic caterpillar shedding its skin and pupating and emerging or the types of birds that have driven that twig mimic to evolve those colors and patterns to begin with, um, and especially things like the parasitic wasps and flies that use them as a host. So that's really what the talk will be about today. I'm gonna to show you lots of caterpillars and tell lots of stories, but we're gonna try and build this whole story. We're gonna look at caterpillars through time and through all of their connections across the natural world. Um, we're gonna build so much into a little caterpillar that each one is gonna seem like a super organism all by itself. And through this exploration, I hope we'll approach um, a much bigger idea of, of biodiversity and why biodiversity actually matters, what it means that we have so many species and that each little species has its own whole story to itself. All right, I hope we're good to move forward. To do this um, briefly, we're gonna look at growth and metamorphosis, sort of a third grade primer with a twist. Um, then dive into herbivory and host plant relationships, how caterpillars um, have become just so closely intertwined with the plants they eat. We'll look at caterpillar predators and especially parasitoids, uh, one of my favorite uh, rather gory subjects. And um, we'll sort of sum that part of the talk up with a complex ecological story. We're gonna look at the harvester butterfly and all the ingredients and relationships that need to come together to have that butterfly present in our area. We'll look at what all of this adds up to. And um, at the end, I hope there'll be time to go into a little bit about how we can um, individually act to sort of support the whole story of these creatures, support these animals in our neighborhoods, in our environments. Okay, so life cycle here at the very basics. Um, when I'm talking about a caterpillar, I'm not really just talking about the caterpillar. We've got an egg, a caterpillar or larva stage, the pupa, which is the living middle stage. It's what the caterpillar becomes when it's done being a caterpillar, done eating, and the adult moth or butterfly, the reproductive stage. Um, even within some of these stages, we have pretty dramatic transformations. I chose the Abbott's Sphinx caterpillar here, a native species that eats grape and Virginia creeper, because young caterpillars are blue with an orange nub and horn, um, mimicking a noxious or toxic sawfly larva that a bird wouldn't want to eat. But when they grow, they get too big to be that anymore. They can't pull off that mimicry. So they shed their skin and they become an incredible foliage mimic and a predator mimic. They have a false eye on their rear end that's shining. So within the caterpillar stage, we can have these transformations and transformations with how the caterpillar interacts with the larger world. Some young caterpillars might feed on trees and when they get older, they go underground and eat the stuff that falls from the trees. In this case, the bigger caterpillar feeds deep within the vine, sort of hidden in dappled light and the younger caterpillar will be out in the open because it's mimicking that toxic creature. Once they're done being caterpillars, the pupa leads a completely different ecological life. It's in the soil in this case. Sometimes we'll have pupa in cocoons or out in the open, but the things that are eating pupa, um, the things that pupa are interacting with, they're different than those things that the caterpillar was interacting with. And then the moth is like a, you know, a, a whole different story altogether. 
In this case, the avid sphinx moth is a bumblebee mimic. It buzzes when it flies, that's how it defends itself, but it's also an important pollinator. Um, I, I'm just learning that this is part of a pollinator series. So we're gonna celebrate this right now. So many of the caterpillars that went through in that um, scroll and that you'll be seeing later on become pollinating moths and butterflies. Um, and they're not often um, nearly as much talked about as the bees, um, but there are a lot of them and some of them are highly specialized pollinators. Okay, so I do tend to focus on caterpillars and that's because, well, I, I mean, I love caterpillars, they're quirky, but also I think they are the ecological sort of heavyweight stage. They are in the perfect position to be of value here. They eat a lot of plants and they're eaten by a lot of things. They're like the glue that holds together the natural world, all of our food webs. Um, and I wanted to start by celebrating that first part, the fact that they eat a lot of leaves or herbivory. What you're watching right here is so important and it's so often either overlooked or even demonized. Um, people don't like the image of a caterpillar eating a leaf. Um, when we see holes in leaves uh, walking down the streets or holes in leaves, especially in our gardens, we tend to assume that that somehow is, is what you'd call damage or some negative action in the environment. In fact, this is an ecological service that, that could give pollination and any other service a run for its money. This caterpillar is doing something that few other organisms can do and it's doing it really, really well. Um, caterpillars eat more leaf material, or in this case, flower bud material, than any other herbivore in our forested ecosystems. By some estimates, you could take all of the other herbivores in our forests and put them on one side and have caterpillars on the other, just caterpillars, and they would be eating more leaves, just the caterpillars, than all of those other herbivores combined. Um, so that's, that's a lot of green material going down the gullet of a caterpillar like the um, groat's pinion here. This is important because, well, we can't eat leaves. A lot of things can't eat leaves and digest leaves. Um, you probably don't go down the street and pick a maple leaf or an oak leaf and start to chew on it. It wouldn't do, it, uh, do us much good. But caterpillars can. They can turn those leaves into a much more usable form of uh, protein energy. And a lot of things can eat caterpillars. I know that we mostly don't walk down the street and eat caterpillars, but we could. <laughs> so caterpillars are doing this service. They are taking the energy that plants brought down from the sunlight and all the nutrients that they brought up from the soil and they're releasing it to the rest of the ecosystem. So we've got to celebrate this activity here. I know that our history in agriculture, our sort of agrarian history has colored this differently. I think our interactions with herbivores have mostly been this creature is trying to eat my crop, right? It's trying to eat the thing I want to eat. But as we become more aware that the overall natural world is important beyond our gardens, beyond our direct food systems, that we need a healthy ecological world, we need to start celebrating this. I recorded this a, a year ago and we put it online and it goes for like 20 minutes, I think. And um, people would just got back to me saying they, they were watching the whole thing and got into sort of a Zen mode that this was just very calming to them, which was surprising uh, to me. All right, so here's another champion eater here. Um, caterpillars, it's not just caterpillar eats plant. It's usually specific caterpillar eats specific plant. We do have a lot of generalist species of caterpillars that eat all kinds of green material, but we actually have more caterpillars that have restricted diets that are really good at eating just a few things. Um, and the stories of those caterpillars can be really magnificent. So this is one of our largest native caterpillars. It's definitely an ecological good guy, um, but it's not a fan of, of many gardeners. This is the tobacco hornworm. Uh, this caterpillar has been around uh, in North America, the genus Manduca for a very long time. And it's been specializing on a particular family of plants for a very long time, the family Solanaceae. So it eats these plants that include peppers, tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, and uh, nightshades and deterras. There's a lot of Solanaceous plants. Um, because it's been eating them for so long, it struck up a, a pretty cool relationship. The plants themselves have been shaped by this caterpillar and the caterpillar has been shaped by the plants. I like to think of them as little horticulturalists because their actions have changed the way these plants have evolved over time. 
Um, maybe long ago, solanaceous plants were pretty edible to most things, but these caterpillars took so much from them, put a lot of pressure on them that the plants ended up evolving a toxin, some kind of chemical defense against herbivory. And for a time that would have given the solanaceae plants some respite from the hornworms. But eventually the hornworms who need to eat those plants uh, find ways to overcome those toxins. Maybe they incorporate them into their own bodies. Maybe they pass the toxins out through their bodies. Um, but one way or another, they're back on those plants eating again. And we got this sort of arms race going with the solanaceous plants becoming toxic, the caterpillars not eating them and then overcoming and being able to eat them again. The plants take it up a notch, the caterpillars take it up a notch until you end up with this group of plants, which is at the very least poisonous and sometimes outright deadly in many of a tropical species, um, just because a caterpillar wanted to eat its leaves. Um, the caterpillar in turn um, has some pretty cool defenses built around the toxins that were originally um, targeted at keeping the caterpillar from eating the plant. Uh, Jesse, uh, who works at the lab, brought us a paper a few years ago called Toxic Halitosis by the Tobacco Hornworm. And the paper outlined how hornworms eating tobacco um, are able to keep nicotine um, sort of extract nicotine from the leaves and keep it as a gas near their spiracles or their breathing holes. And when they're attacked by predators, they burp nicotine gas at their predators. So again, both caterpillar and plant have been shaped by their interactions. Um, oh, I had this little video to, to again, make anybody who grows tomatoes feel a little uncomfortable here. Um, another side of this is actually that these caterpillars may have made things like tomato plants more interesting to us as um, farmers in the first place. The toxins that are meant to deter their herbivory um, often relate to flavors that we're interested in. So some of the flavors of a tomato are built up by those anti-herbivory toxins that are only there because the caterpillar chose to eat that plant. It's striking in the brassica where that bitter taste is an anti-herbivory toxin, maybe geared at things like the um, cabbage white butterfly. All right. <laughs> um, further, the tobacco hornworm, we could also think of it as a farmer at the adult stage, remember that life cycle, the tobacco hornworm's moth, the Carolina Sphinx, has the longest tongue of any native pollinator here in New England. And it's pollinating many of the plants it will eat as a caterpillar. So especially further south, these are big time pollinators of tobacco and datura. Um, any of these night flowering white uh, tube shaped flowers are geared towards these sphinx moths. Um, I love that idea. Yes, they're eating the plant just like we eat plants, but they're making sure to spread it around later. I'm, I'm choosing all of everybody's favorite caterpillars here, I think, we'll see. <laughs> so here is another native caterpillar, another big time eater. Um, and another specialist. This is the Eastern Tent Caterpillar, another ecological good guy, even if it's eating your favorite cherry tree, this is not something that's bad for the environment. They're very, very good at eating black cherry plants. This is a single night time lapse. They're gonna go through the whole thing. Um, they have, similar to the hornworm and the tomato family plants, they've evolved with this cherry plant. The cherries can leaf out after being defoliated by these. So if you had a healthy cherry plant to begin with, you are going to have, oops, sorry, you're going to have it uh, survive even after defoliation. And the caterpillars have also utilized the toxins in cherry leaves. So cherry has all the ingredients of um, hydrogen cyanide in the leaves. The caterpillars eat those leaves and they actually create hydrogen cyanide in their body. So these caterpillars are quite poisonous to most things. As a native caterpillar though, things have evolved, just like they have adapted to their plant, other things have adapted to them and they are used by countless predators and parasitoids as a host. Um, one of the predators is pretty famous. It's the yellow-billed cuckoo. Most birds can only handle a few of these at a time. The cyanide is intense and the yellow hairs on the tent caterpillar's body uh, will actually coat the bird's intestines and make it so they can't digest food as effectively. A cuckoo comes along and they actually migrate up in time with these tent caterpillars. So they arrive and they nest when there's a lot of tent caterpillars around. They rip open a nest in a way no other birds will and they just eat all the tent caterpillars. They're immune to the cyanide 
And when they get all gummed up by those hairs, they just regurgitate their stomach lining and grow a new one. So it's a nice little whole story there, actually. I mean, you can see the relationship between the caterpillar and its host plants, but you also see how a native caterpillar has spawned adaptations in the things that eat it. All right. Okay, so not all birds um, are as specialized as a cuckoo. In fact, most birds don't really care what kind of caterpillar they're eating. Most birds can't eat tent caterpillars, but they can eat pretty much anything else. Um, Doug Tallamy, who's done a lot of work on native plants and insects, um, uh, did a study and found out that it takes something between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars to rear one batch of chickens. So birds are putting an intense amount of pressure on caterpillars. Uh, they're eating a lot of caterpillars. They're constantly hunting for them. Um, and just as the birds are putting the pressure on the caterpillars, the birds are completely dependent on caterpillars being there in the first place for their survival. Um, this is sort of the second part of the whole story, moving from herbivory to the things that are eating caterpillars. Brett, if there are any sort of confusion questions or anything you want to bring up, this would be a good point. There's one question that was my own question, but it's a good time to ask it. Um, so all this herbivory, all this eating must lead to a lot of pooping and a lot of caterpillar frass. Does that also play an important ecological role in our forest? Is it fertilizer like other um, mm -hmm. animal scat is? I haven't found a lot of information uh, or I don't know of any information that's out there on whether the frass itself is good fertilizer, um, but it's certainly a, a sort of decomposing role. So we've got caterpillars eating leaves and turning it into caterpillar meat, which is food for other things, but we also have just those leaves being pre-broken down into frass. Um, my sense is, you know, these frass pellets are going to be full of all the parts of a leaf and all the chemicals that the caterpillar didn't want. So sometimes that means, you know, maybe it's not great for some things and other times maybe they're actually full of, of delicious nitrogen and who knows what. Um, we, we've at the lab constantly tried to find a use for caterpillar poop. We create buckets of it. And um, Jesse was saying, you know, maybe fertilizer. I thought fancy teas, you know, you could sell Cecropia frass as a cherry flavored tea or something. But uh, this is what happens, Brett, when I get asked questions during a talk. I start talking about caterpillar frass tea. <laughs> Anything else? That was the only question that has come up so far. Sure. They sure do make a lot of it. If anyone's been around during a caterpillar outbreak, um, native or non-native, they'll, they'll know they've got caterpillar poop in their hair and they can hear it hitting the ground. Um, so it's a fact of life here at the lab. All right. So... Um, I was talking about uh, sort of the pressure that birds put on caterpillars. And that pressure is sort of wonderful uh, because it creates all that charisma I was talking about in caterpillars, all the fun, all the surprise, the trickery, uh, the bells and whistles. Birds are caterpillars' um, number one visual predator. So they're the number one predator of caterpillars that's going around and using their eyesight you know, all day long to try and find these creatures as food. Um, birds are really, really good at finding caterpillars, it turns out, and caterpillars have to have had to evolve some amazing defensive adaptations, defensive adaptations to stay hidden or to message birds. And I thought this was a good example, one that we had right now. It's a very large twig mimic caterpillar. Some of you may just think you're seeing twigs, but there's a oak beauty caterpillar right in the forefront, That's right? here, my buddy. <laughs> yep, um, I see a little note. This is a geometrid inchworm caterpillar, the oak beauty. Um, and what I love about this is it's not just a brown caterpillar on a brown twig. This is a caterpillar that's got, you know, every variation across its body of color, texture, and pattern to look just like an oak twig. It's got knobs and unlikely bumps. It keeps its body in this sort of strange crooked way. Um, birds are better than being fooled by just a brown caterpillar on a brown twig. Caterpillars have had to evolve the most amazing camouflage to stay hidden. I'm gonna put this onto the microscope just for fun here um, because this one even has a, a high detail. Um, there we go. Oak often has these shiny little spots all over it and the caterpillar does as well here. So this is just, the texture, there we go, of our caterpillar. 
And I really think we've got bird brains to thank for this kind of thing. Here down at the bottom, we've got these things called rootlet seti. This is where the caterpillar meets the twig. The caterpillar has these fleshy lobes and they help blend the line between caterpillar and twig so there's no shadow. All right. And we're just gonna look at some caterpillars that we could say were created or painted by birds. Um, so this is a magnificent one. This is a large sphinx moth caterpillar. It's called the four horned sphinx or elm sphinx. Um, again, it's not just a brown caterpillar on some brown dead leaves. This is a caterpillar that's been fine tuned by the intelligence and eyes of birds to look just like a rolled up elm leaf. It's got the leaf veins mapped out across it. Its horn looks like the petiole of a leaf and the texture and feel of the caterpillar is exactly the same as an elm leaf too. In dry years or hot years, we get a lot of these brown forms so that they can blend in on all those dead leaves. But on wet years um, or cool years, we get green forms that look just like a green elm leaf. Um, here's a, a variation on that. This is the um, lace-capped caterpillar. Uh, it eats oaks, but it eats oaks late in the season. So we've got a caterpillar that's mimicking not just the leaf, but the leaf plus all of the disease and damage and galls and you know, skeletonized bits of a late season leaf. If you had just a bright green caterpillar like you might find in spring on a late fall leaf, the birds would find it. Um, if you had this caterpillar in spring, the birds might find it against that green foliage. Uh, caterpillars that eat plants of other sorts. If they're eating flowers, they're gonna look like those flowers. Really what we're talking about is an interaction between bird's eyes and host plant, right? The caterpillar lives on this host. That's its entire background. The birds are looking for the caterpillars. So the caterpillars end up looking like the host plants. This is the goldenrod shinia caterpillar, uh, common in fall on goldenrods. Here's one that wants to be on any kind of flower. It's the decorator emerald, really, really common backyard caterpillar, uh, especially on daisy fleabane in June and July. Um, they will dress up as any flower that they end up on. So we put this on a daisy fleabane, it ends up sticking white petals all over its back with silk. Right now it's on a blue uh, vervain and it's got those purple flowers all over its back. This is a different approach here. This one's not trying to blend in. Um, similar to how the monarch caterpillar extracts toxins from the milkweed it eats and becomes a poisonous caterpillar. This is the black dotted prominent common in um, things like power line cuts and barrens around here. It eats plants in the legume family. Presumably this is quite toxic as it looks sort of like a gaudy 1970s pleather couch, um, a little too loud. Uh, but you can see it from across the street and you get close to it and it throws its head back over its body. That's its head that looks like a little button there um, over its back and it will regurgitate green fluid. Um, so another result of birds being hungry and birds having the capacity to learn from their mistakes. So if a bird eats a bright caterpillar and gets sick, well, it's not gonna wanna keep eating these bright caterpillars. I don't know what to tell you about this one. Some caterpillars are just really weird and um, maybe that's a defense. This is the Harris's three spot for the Harris Center. Um, it's a local species that is equal parts bird dropping mimic, um, spider mimic and head banger. Um, overall it looks sort of like a bird dropping but it's last segment is swollen and has false eyes, looks like a jumping spider. And when disturbed, it rears, uh, puts its rear end in the air and gnashes its uh, last set of pro legs like, like fangs. On the front end, it wears its old shed head capsules as a hat. Caterpillars have to shed as they grow. This one keeps its old head and then basically whacks you with them if you get too close. So this may be a combination of a defense against a number of different types of predators and parasitoids. But again, we have those to thank for some of the charisma we see in our caterpillars. And predator mimicry is probably the best example of that. Um, thanks to birds being afraid of snakes, we have some pretty adorable caterpillars to work with at our programs. This is a spice bush swallowtail. It's sort of a cartoon image of a snake, a bird foraging for food, We'll turn over a leaf or investigate um, a little shelter that these create. And all of a sudden it'll be presented with these big googly eyes. We presume from this that, you know, if the caterpillar evolved these eye spots, they must be somewhat effective. That birds aren't necessarily watching out for a realistic snake eye, but maybe they have some kind of template in their heads that means danger. 
So concentric circles on something like that could be matched to any potential dangerous eye and the bird could react very quickly in a way it might not be able to if it had to consciously think, okay, what kind of snake eye is that that's in front of me? Um, I like the idea that the way an insect has evolved to defend itself against a predator can actually illuminate on the way a predator perceives the world um, unlike anything else I can think of. I mean, the look of this caterpillar gives us insight into how a bird thinks. This one's a little more realistic. We already looked at the species. It's the Abbott Sphinx, beautiful false eye on its rear end. Um, it'll lift up that rear eye when really disturbed and it can make a grinding noise that sounds a little like a snake. Um, pretty cool caterpillar that you can find in grape and Virginia creeper. Not all of the defenses against birds are simply uh, physical. They're not all colors and patterns. Um, some of them are behavioral. There's caterpillars with those inflatable horns or inflatable tails. Um, this caterpillar has, has quite the surprise. I'm worried that I did, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second and I'm gonna reshare to make sure we've got sound here. Hold on, there we go. All right, that was important because here we go. Everyone getting the sound there? So this caterpillar, the walnut sphinx, when disturbed, squeaks at you. It pushes air out its spiracles and they have these little noisemakers on them. Um, a study done at Harvard uh, came to a conclusion that I'm still finding hard to believe, but it, it looks solid. Um, when this sound is played to chickadees, they react exactly as they would if a chickadee gave an alarm call. So one thought is that this caterpillar being approached by a, a flock of uh, chickadees and titmice and nuthatches would release this sound and cause all the birds to fly away thinking there was a hawk nearby and that a chickadee gave that call. Um, I think it's just, just wonderful and surprising. If I was a chickadee and a caterpillar suddenly squeaked like that at me, I might just run away either way. Oops, <laughs> okay. Um, finally, caterpillars can also escape from these predators um, by changing their whole life history, their phenology or, or their seasonality. Um, we have a lot of twig mimicking caterpillars here in New England that actually overwinter as caterpillars. So the common litrosis here, this caterpillar um, spends the entire winter freezing and thawing out on a branch somewhere, as do these uh, various Euclina caterpillars here and the porcelain gray. Um, by doing this, they're able to pupate and be done with their feeding stage, their, their sort of um, vulnerable caterpillar stage before the masses of, of spring migrants and breeding birds get here. So, so many caterpillars are just hatching now, and those are all going to be eating on the trees when the warblers are coursing through our treetops. These guys will be pupa, they'll be done. Um, that said, there really is no complete safe time from birds, and these caterpillars are eaten um, specifically by kinglets. If we've got birders out there, the golden crown kinglet was studied by Bert Heinrich up in Maine, and he looked at their gut contents in the wintertime and found that their diet was consisting of about 80 plus percent, just two species of overwintering geometric inchworm. So I love this story because people say, why should we care about caterpillars? I always go because caterpillars are awesome. But um, if you care about birds, birds need caterpillars. It's nice to be able to say that golden crown kinglets need porcelain gray geometric caterpillars to exist here in New England. It's very specific. All right, we're going to take another little turn here. Any uh, questions coming up about the sort of bird predation side of things? Nope, I haven't seen any. I saw one about the headbanger caterpillar. How does it attach those those heads? We got the first ever video of it. Um, when they shed their head capsule, there's this very complex thing that happens with a, a hard part on their neck called the prothoracic shield. And um, it slides down with the old skin, locks onto the old head, and the prothoracic shield is already mounted onto new hairs underneath. I need to show you the video, but uh, it's on our Facebook page and our, our YouTube page. Um, it's really cool. Um, but yeah, the Harris's three spot is a, a unique one. Um, all right, let me get a live view set up here. Put my other caterpillar away. What we're gonna look at now um, is happening entirely 
inside this little box. Um, I went out this morning into the swamps and I looked for sedges. These are like grasses, but sedges have edges. Um, and I looked for any little brown spots on those sedges. When you see brown spots on a plant outside, sometimes it's just damage. It's, you know, someone walked on the plant, uh, maybe a caterpillar ate a bite, but often it's a leaf mining insect, something that's actually inside the plant as you're looking at it. And that's what's going on with these brown spots, those brown lines on this sedge leaf. So this is like my microscope slide. I'm gonna shift the microscope to having a backlight and make sure I've got the right one. So we're moving from bird predation to something a little different. Um, let me get the right one up here. Here is a caterpillar inside of a leaf under our microscope. I hope you can all make that out okay. Um, leaf miners, it, there are just about as many caterpillar species that live inside of a leaf or a stem um, as there are that live externally. And some of these can be quite big, the stem borers, and some of them are just a few millimeters like this leaf miner and a sedge. These overwinter in sedge leaves under the snow, they're some of the first leaf miners we can work with in the spring. They are everywhere. There's hundreds and hundreds of these um, in just a small patch of the airport swamps. If I zoom in, we can actually watch this thing eating you know, just a few cells at a time. Um, for some species we work with in the summertime, you can actually see them swallowing like two or three swells, cells at a time. It all depends on the plant they eat. Um, this is a crazy level of specialization already, right? There's this moth out there that eats, you know, one kind of sedge, one kind of little thing in a swamp. It knows where to find it. It lays its egg in it. It can live inside of it between the top and the bottom. It eats only one layer of cells. Um, it overwinters in it. The specialization just with the host plant is, is miraculous, but almost none of the ones we collect give us moths. Most of them give us tiny, tiny little wasps, parasitoid wasps that are specialized to lay an egg through the leaf into the caterpillar and grow up inside the caterpillar in the leaf. And the reason I spent so much time in the swamp this morning was because I wanted to try and find one of those. And I think we're gonna have some luck here. So we've got an abandoned leaf mine, which will come in a minute. There we go. And there was no caterpillar in it, but there was this blob here. Let me zoom out a little bit. All right, you'll have to forgive the microscope uh, lighting issues for a second here. There we go. Can you make out this sort of uh, jelly bean like thing right here? It's not a caterpillar, the caterpillar is long gone, but it is moving. And if you watch really closely, you might see this undulating brown thing. This is the larva of a parasitic chalcidoid wasp. Um, the caterpillar that was eating this leaf hosted this wasp inside of its body. The wasp popped out in the last few days and now it's sitting there in the mine getting ready to pupate. Um, in probably by tomorrow evening, instead of being this little round jelly bean like thing, we'll actually see a little wasp pupa with a little shape of a wasp head. And then within a week or two, the wasp will emerge. Um, this is what it's all about for me. I mean, this is the whole story here, right? We, we've got caterpillars specializing on plants. Sure, we've got birds eating caterpillars. Some of them specialize on things like the tent caterpillars. Most are just out to eat them wholesale. But we have things like a parasitic wasp that uses one kind of caterpillar that uses one kind of shed, um, one kind of sedge in one habitat. It's a marvelous level of detail. Um, and you would think stories like this were sort of exceptional, but they're not. The more we do this, this is sort of the rule, not the exception. I mean, every caterpillar we work with has parasitoids, usually many, and some of those at least will be specialists like this one. I don't know if anyone's gotten a chance to see this little thing move. Just saw the question, are they super thin? You know, for a creature this size, um, the thickness of a sedge leaf is pretty ample. They are definitely compressed side to side. The adult wasps will come out and they sort of, you know, pop back into three dimensions. They look like, um, you know, a normal insect, but very, very tiny. Um, we had this at a program and it's a great thing to have for education, you know, talk about scale, to talk about the sheer magnitude of, of life that's outside. You may think what can be in a single leaf and then look at all those leaves. Um, 
But uh, we were watching a leaf miner walk around and, and by the end of the program, it had died and this thing had come out of it. And that's that's something that really, um, you know, maybe at first it shocks, but by the end of it, everyone's in awe of, of what this represents. How does it sure. exit the leaf? Um, so, well, I've got a little slide here that shows the adult moth, which is quite the, the diva here. This is the Cosmopteryx moth. That's the adult of the caterpillar. Um, so the caterpillar, I can remember with this one, these guys pupate within the leaf, I believe, but a lot of leaf miners will chew their way out as a caterpillar and then pupate on the forest floor, or um, they'll chew an exit hole first and then pupate in the leaf. Uh, the caterpillar is definitely the stage that has to make the sort of escape hole, right? Um, these moths are gorgeous. You probably won't notice them at your light, but if you in the fall sit down in a bunch of sedge in a marsh, um, you may see them dancing all around you. Um, so this, this is the rare moth that we sometimes see compared to the wasps that we often see. All right, so we're going to delve into parasitism. Um, I won't be able to see your faces, so I don't know if, if I'm creating, um, again, horror or uh, a magical feeling of, of ecological beauty and oneness, but I'll just have to make my own assumptions. Um, this is the caterpillar, the groat's pinion that we watched eating at the beginning of the talk. Um, when we find them in the wild, we rarely get to take them through this life cycle. We rarely get the adult moth. Um, at least half the time, and in recent years, more often than not, instead of getting the adult moth, we get something like this. Um, this incredible little wasp, I mean, this thing's only a couple of millimeters, is called the Eulophid wasp. It's a male with those antler antenna. Um, and we see them all the time on these springtime caterpillars. The larvae are ectoparasitoids. So in the upper image of the caterpillar, the caterpillar is hosting all these little green squishy larvae on the outside. In the middle image, the larvae have basically finished feeding and they're turning yellow, getting ready to go through their own metamorphosis. Um, in the bottom image, they've shed their skin and they've become pupa, um, which will then become the wasp. Um, very common again. Um, what's also common is if you look on the head of this caterpillar, it's got the egg of a tachinid fly parasitoid. So this caterpillar gave us a whole bunch of little eulophid wasps and it gave us a tachinid fly. Um, so one little caterpillar, its relationship with its plants, its predators, and all of these different parasitoids that it can support. A lot going on in the whole story of a caterpillar. Um, time to celebrate our parasitoids a little bit. This gorgeous blue ichneumonid wasp came out of a springtime geometrid inchworm. This is a wasp you might see on things like um, viburnum and um, uh, dogwood flowers as a pollinator. This gorgeous ichneumonid wasp came out of a cute little woolly bear. So woolly bears give us um, all the fun of seeing them in the fall, rearing them in the spring, and occasionally they give us a pollinator like this wasp, which you would see later in the season, maybe on sweet pepper bush. This is our largest ichneumonid wasp um, that uses caterpillars, uh, absolutely spectacular animal. It only uses our giant silk moths, lunas, cecropias, polyphemus, um, pretty impressive animal. We've seen them a few times. We've actually reared them at the lab. When we get to this point, you know, I'm certainly sad when one of my Cecropia caterpillars has been parasitized, but I'm not mad at this creature. This is part of the Cecropia story. Um, this is a native insect interacting with another native insect, insect in balance, um, using it in a way that it's been using it for a very, very long time. So to me, instead of being the killer of a Cecropia caterpillar, this creature here, it just makes the Cecropia story all the much larger and more inspiring. This is a little tachinid fly uh, waving hello. This one came out of a woolly bear. And this tachinid is a specialist on just two species of caterpillar, of sphinx caterpillar, the wave sphinx and that four horned or elm sphinx we saw earlier. Um, tachinids, I think, are, are a good discussion here. You see the bristles all over their body. Um, they help this insect be a pretty good pollinator. Um, we see tachinid flies on flowers all the time. Uh, this, I think it's a cow parsnip, has um, you know, four or five species, of, sorry, three or four species of tachinid fly on it. And that's another sort of convoluted story, uh, ecological story I love to think about. It's not so easy to figure out what's important in the natural world. Here we needed a caterpillar to eat a plant, 
we needed a fly to eat the caterpillar and we needed that fly to come out and find a plant to be a pollinator. It's not a directional, easy to think about thing. Of course, that's not the end. Um, one thing we've learned at the lab and, and you might be getting suspicious about this by now is there really is no end. Um, when you've got a wasp, all of a sudden that, that parasitoid is now a resource. This is something that something is gonna to evolve to use. And a few times at the lab, we've had a sedge with a caterpillar in it that was parasitized by a wasp that was parasitized by another wasp, a hyperparasitoid. So I'm gonna um, play a short video. I think it's about a minute and a half um, showing a moment in the lab when I was filming parasitism. I was filming um, Burkhanid wasp larvae emerging from a caterpillar's back um, and a new player, another wasp showed up on my film stage. Um, and I'm really proud of this video. So I always find a way to show. <laughs> So this is very common in the lab. It's very common in nature, and it's very common in your um, tomato patches if you get horned worms. There are burkhanid wasps, tiny little wasps that lay eggs into the caterpillar. Um, the larvae eat the caterpillar from the inside out. Sort of the caterpillar is their mobile hamburger, their nursery and, and food. And they emerge and they spin their cocoons on the caterpillar's back. This does kill the caterpillar. Um, these burkhanids are actually a major, major control or, or balance, I should say, for a lot of caterpillars. We at our program sort of have realized people root for the underdog. Uh, not many people at first are, are pro burkhanid wasp larva as it's coming out of a caterpillar. Um, but as soon as we see this, uh, we can start to turn the story around a little bit. This burkhanid wasp is thinning a cocoon, it's a little um, so the movement still at a time. And it's spinning that cocoon because it needs to protect itself from the things that want to be it. And when you watch it, you know, trying to make this house for itself to protect itself, all of a sudden it's the underdog. Um, it's also rather amazingly beautiful, um, not the larva itself, but this process of spinning the cocoon. Um, so people tend to start to maybe root for them a little bit. And I was filming this, expecting this to be the whole story, that everything I was going to capture. And while this was on my photo stage, um, a tiny little green wasp flew in from inside the building, um, which was a little alarming, because it turns out the inside of the Caterpillar Lab is a little bit too active in the ecological sense for, for my peace of mind. Um, but she came in, and she landed on the stage, and she wouldn't leave. Um, she, you can watch her be aggressive with me every once in a while right there. And she started laying eggs into the burkhanid wasp larva that were in the process of emerging from the caterpillar. So this is a hyperparasitoid. This is the, the wasp for the wasp for the caterpillar for the plant. And there are some you know, medium generalist hyperparasitoids, but there's also specialists where you've got one wasp for one wasp for one caterpillar for one plant. All right, let me see where we're at here. Cool, so I mean, hyperparasitism, it's, it's like once we get good at talking about host plant relationships or birds or wasps, all of a sudden there's this whole new level to get into. So now at our shows, it's not good enough unless we can show a wasp laying an egg into a wasp laying egg into a caterpillar. So we can actually put um, hornworms with burkhanid wasp cocoons on their back outside and we check them every hour and invariably the hyperparasitoids show up and we can capture them and show this all under the microscope. Um, but it brings to mind sort of our, our favorite quote or poem at the lab, um, which originates, uh, you know, this one's written in 1872, but the material originates in 1733 from a Jonathan Swift poem. I'm going to read it out loud here. Great fleas have little fleas upon their backs to bite them, and little fleas have lesser fleas, and so ad infinitum. And the great fleas themselves in turn have greater fleas to go on, while these again have greater still and greater still and so on. So 
this is sort of impressive that in 1733, Jonathan Swift's walking around with this idea when he sees, you know, whatever, a bird or a caterpillar or a flea on the sidewalk, that it's part of this incredible uh, chain of interactions, this multi-trophic celebration. Um, and we just see this time and time again, um, these chains of interactions. So this is that wasp, the terra mallet, um, that visited our um, sphinx caterpillar with the braconids on its back. Here's another hyperparasitoid. Um, this one requires uh, fall webworms, often thought of as a pest, but it is another native caterpillar. Fall webworms are used by a large variety of parasitoid wasps. This one uses the meteorus wasp, a really gorgeous little thing. And this I had to throw in there. This was at a program. We were looking into a sphinx egg, um, a single egg of a caterpillar, and we found that there were egg parasitoids, wasps, which grow up inside the egg. But there wasn't just one species of egg parasitoid. There were two. The black sort of form in the background is actually a larger wasp. Um, there were two little yellow ones and one big black wasp, two different parasitoids in one sphinx egg. So I, I hope these ideas are sort of blowing you away a little bit about how much can be going on in these little spaces. Um, all right, let me stop sharing for a second. So I'm looking at the time and I'm realizing I'm way behind because I'm telling weird stories and going on. Um, there are different options. Um, I can tell another great story. Um, I can tell another great story and have a conclusion and wrap things up as I would normally. Um, or I could do a little interpretive dance about caterpillars right now. Um, Brett uh, and Miles, what's your take on the situation? <laughs> I think um, maybe tell tell a story, but have that be also a wrap up story, just so that anyone who has places to go won't feel like they're missing out on all the other good sure. stuff. Um, and right. there are many people in the chat who want an interpretive dance. So I guess I'll leave that up to you. Um, but um, I used to break the ice in the talk by doing like the defensive um, twirls and, and strange movements that Datana and Furcula caterpillars did to, to keep safe from birds, but I'll spare you guys. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I'll tell another story and wrap up. Um, there might be some sort of threads left hanging. So if you guys have questions, feel free to email me. Um, Brad, I'm sure we can get some contact information up somehow, although I do have a slide at the end. All right, so let me get going here. Share screen. Awesome. All right, so this is a story that I hope uh, brings it all together a little bit, and it's from this summer. Um, and it starts with ants. But don't forget, we are the Caterpillar Lab. So we're gonna get back to caterpillars again. Um, at the Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens, we had a socially distant program this summer. It was the only one we did. Um, but before the program, we went out into the woods and we found acorn ants. Um, there was a big oak tree in the woods, lots of acorns underneath. And we found two different species of these ants that make an entire home within a single acorn. Um, just to get these ants in the forest there, a lot had to come together. So we needed an oak tree to grow and mature and thrive and eventually produce those acorns. The acorns had to fall onto the forest floor and survive long enough um, to be used by a very particular beetle. Now, some of those weren't used at all. They might have germinated the next year into oaks. Many of them were eaten by squirrels, but a few were found by this beetle, the weevil with a long snout, and the weevil drills a tiny little hole in the acorn, lays an egg into the acorn, and the uh, grub of the weevil eats the inside of the acorn, hollowing it out. So these weevils are sort of making these perfect little ant condos on the forest floor. When the grub pops out of the acorn, they leave a hole and the ants move in. Once you have ants in a forest, in an area, everything changes. These are, again, little ecological keystone uh, creatures. They are scavenging all over the forest floor. They're moving things around. They're moving seeds around. Um, they're eating other insects. And they are allowing some insects to survive when they couldn't survive otherwise. Um, ants actually enter into a lot of mutualisms with other insects. The one we're going to look at is this creature. This is the woolly alder aphid. A lot of aphids um, enter into mutualisms with ants. Aphids put their little feeding tubes into the stem of a plant and they draw out the sugars. They draw out so many sugars, they often have excess. And then they exude that excess as these little uh, sugary droplets called honeydew. The ants come along and maybe normally they would eat these aphids sort of like you eat a hamburger, 
Um, but instead the aphids present them with that sugary liquid, the ants drink the liquid, and then the ants wanna take care of the aphids. They want the aphids to stay around so that the ants can keep getting access to that hard to reach sugar. So this little creature here, it's been found that this aphid and others really fail to thrive and to spread in an environment that doesn't have ants to protect them. To get these aphids, um, hold on a second. Let me just bring some up under the microscope. To get these little aphids, a lot has to come together. We see if we can actually witness the aphids um, releasing their little honey droplets here. So to get these funny alder aphids, we need ants in the environment. In the case of the acorn ants, we needed the oak tree, we needed the acorns, the acorn weevils, the ants to move in. We also needed alders, so we needed alder plants and everything they need to thrive, the right environment, the right light, the right resources. And when you get all that coming together, finally you can get a colony like this. So it's not easy just to get these aphids. Um, by the way, for gardeners who have aphids, um, you'll, you'll be able to watch ants tend those as well. You'll see ants swarming all over them. But once you get all this coming together, once you have all the ingredients there, all the relationships active, then finally you get to our caterpillar. Right? And this is it, a very, very unique creature. It's uh, the harvester butterfly caterpillar. It's our only obligate predatory caterpillar in North America. It has to eat meat and it has to eat aphids. And in New England, it's just eating these woolly alder aphids. And when I look at this caterpillar, I just, I'm sort of astounded by what has to come together to have this creature in our world. I mean, it's not subtle. It's, it's a lot of things. I mean, ant colonies of any type need a lot of things to support them. All of that in place, then we need to get the aphids and all the plant material they needed. And finally, the butterflies have to find these colonies, lay their eggs on them and start chowing down. So, you know, this isn't involving uh, parasites and birds yet, but it's just showing that we need a healthy load of connections and interactions in our environment to support the creatures we have. Um, the butterfly too actually needs these aphids. You don't see harvester butterflies all that often on flowers. Um, they nectar primarily on the aphids themselves. They land on the aphid colonies. The aphids are presenting the ants with that honeydew and the butterflies drink the honeydew. Um, the caterpillars and the butterflies somehow don't get attacked by the ants. We think it's a bit of chemical camouflage there. <sighs> so that was a lot going on. We found all of that happening in these gardens at Maine. Uh, the aphids I just showed you behind me, they came from the airport um, here in town in Swansea, where I've also found the caterpillars. So these systems are alive and well nearby. Um, I sort of like to go back to the idea of, of acorns here. Uh, and maybe this is a good way to sum up the talk tonight. I hope that through telling the story of, of diversity and a special especially diversity of interaction and trying to show that a caterpillar isn't an isolated thing, but is part of this whole story. I hope that we'll start looking at the creatures around us, whether it's a caterpillar crossing a road um, or whether it's a bee visiting a flower, um, sort of more like we look at an acorn. I mean, an acorn is an object in front of us, right? And there's interesting things happening with it. Um, it could turn into an oak tree. It might just have a colony of ants inside of it. But when we look at an acorn, we all sort of inherently know that it's part of this much bigger story. When you see an acorn, you can't deny that whatever its story, when you look up from it, there's the oak tree, right? The oak tree with its trunk and its bark and all of the insects and creatures that use those resources with the branches, the leaves, thousands and thousands of leaves with all the caterpillars on those leaves, the galls on the leaves, the birds eating the caterpillars, the wasps and flies eating the caterpillars, the wasps eating the wasps, eating the caterpillars, eating the oak leaf. There's a lot more to the story of an acorn than we can perceive by just looking at the acorn. And that's true for everything around us. Sure, the oak might be the ultimate superorganism in New England, but a woolly bear caterpillar has this extended dendritic story behind it that I really want us to recognize and celebrate. Um, and that's how we celebrate the sort of importance of biodiversity, the importance of having all these relationships there and healthy, because without them, if you start to break down this whole story, things start to fail, we start to have a cascade of events um, and a lessening of the diversity in our world. I really wish I could go into my whole conclusion. Um, I'll just say that basically, 
biodiversity is a wonderful strength of the environment. It's all of our checks and balances. It's why we have so much to look forward each year. It's why we can assume that there's gonna be leaves on the trees and caterpillars on those leaves and birds to eat those caterpillars. But there's also a weakness there in when we cause rapid and unpredicted change. So if we introduce an invasive species, if a native tree goes extinct, if we have rapid climate change or a whole habitat is destroyed, um, if we cover the you know, area in pesticides, we can break down those all important interactions and connections and cause cascading effects. So the three caterpillars in front of you are ash feeding sphinx caterpillars. Ash is disappearing because of the emerald ash borer. The effects of something like that go far beyond losing a single tree. So keeping this stuff in mind, perhaps we can make more informed and realistic decisions about what we do in the natural world to avoid that breakdown. Um, sorry guys, <laughs> really fell behind today. I guess I got excited. Um, here's my contact info. Um, if you can take a screenshot or Brett, uh, maybe you can pass this around. And because I know it'll come up in the questions, um, I also just have an image of the microscope I was using today. Um, this one's a little on the fancy side, but any HDMI microscope that you can hook up to a screen without a computer, some of them are a hundred bucks, um, can give you a lot of fun looking at these little creatures. So thanks for inviting me to speak and um, maybe there'll be a part two sometime, Brett. Microscope. That must be in Lee's cause face, huh? Thank, thank you so much, Sam. Uh, mm -hmm. This is amazing. There is... There's a ton of um, people cheering for you in the chat. Um, a few people were asking about prints and um, other ways to support the Caterpillar Lab. So I will, um, I, I did put the link to the your, your website in the chat. I encourage you all to go. Um, they have a store. They also are a nonprofit organization. So I'm sure that donations are always welcome. Um, yeah. Well, I'm more than happy to, to stay for questions. And um, again, for all of the things you just brought up, if people want to email me, I'm happy to um, uh, send information. Yes, yeah, so I put um, I put Sam's email and it's on the screen now too. And there's a bunch of people, I, I think probably we don't have time for questions, but I do want to say there's been a, like five people who came in late want to know about the recording. So yes, we are recording. Um, this will be on the Harris Center's YouTube, but um, probably not till later next week. And um, we're just so appreciative, Sam, for um, there's like 8 million threads of stories that you just shared with us that I think we're all going to be thinking when we just look at, at our own yards and lawns and woods. Um, and I suspect you inspired a few people to go visit Lonza Airport as well. So quite a place yeah but everywhere around here is, has got a surprising number of critters um brett if you don't mind i would love to um, maybe you can copy the questions that were asked in the chat or something like that and send them my way i'm just always curious as to what people want to know about yeah. um and thanks everyone for for i don't know taking part in this and apologies again that i only got through half of my talk but uh it's a we'll pleasure we'll have to bring you back for part two <laughs> i think that that's clear I bet every person who came tonight would, would love to hear you talk some more. So thanks, Sam. And thank you, everybody, for, um, for joining us tonight. Good night.